This time I'd like to ask uh, Meredith Oakland, our past staff advisory council president, please come forward and introduce our guest speaker. Keynote speaker. Unparalleled commitment that never 
students' success. Closing gaps in achievement and delivering a robust campus experience. So, what is the connection between an emerging research university and student success? Can you be an emerging research university and meet this commitment to student success? It is often said that a university is a bridge from potential to opportunity. Unfortunately, four out of ten students in many institutions, including ours, don't make it across the bridge. And they disappear from higher education. So a vision for research at Texas A&M University Corpus Christi is to create a research scholarship and creative activity enterprise that widens the bridge and makes it possible for more people to successfully cross and become successful students and professionals. It's really important if you're going to have a vision you're going to ask the question, where are we going to go? To have an idea of where you have been. And for me, I think of vision like pyramid. And I think the Mayan pyramid for a reason. Because part of our mission is to take advantage of our connection to the cultural border with Latin America. And take that national and international promise. But if we're going to have a research vision for Texas A&M University in Corpus Christi, we have to remember our history. Seventy years ago, we were University of Corpus Christi. To have this vision, we have to remember that we're part of the A&M system. And if we've been that since 1989. We have to remember that we've only been in M. Corpus Christi for about 23, 24 years. And we only downward expanded in 1994. We have to remember that we're connected to the Arctic field. And we have a tremendous history, a tremendous capacity in the arts. We have to remember that with the help of former President Ferguson, and the tremendous endowment of Ed Hart that we now have the Hart Research Institute, we would not be talking about emerging research if we did not have the Hart Research Institute. We have to remember the generosity of the community for providing the land that is not going to be momentum for campus. It is now campus. We cannot forget the support of the Chancellor and the tremendous support of former President Kilbrew to help bring the drone test site here, which is now creating a capacity in unmanned systems at this university. And we can't forget what every one of you in this room has done to create the tremendous growth that we have at this university, reaching 12,000 students last fall. So visions are like pyramids. And keep getting sharper as you keep getting older. So how do we build on the growth that we've had so far? I would like to argue that we start by creating a unique identity. And it doesn't take a genius to figure out that, that identity starts with the fact that we are an island. Okay? The office. The one thing that really sets us apart, we keep saying, we're the only university on its own island in the whole United States. In fact, a recent ranking, a by the sea ranking, had us as the number one university by the sea. Now, how many, and I'm going to ask you questions, how many of you have heard of the Carnegie classification of institutions of higher ed? Anybody? Okay. We are a doctoral granting institution. Of the 50 institutions that were ranked by the sea, 
20 of them are doctoral graduates. Of the 20, four are Hispanic serving institutions. So right there, there are 4,700 some institutions of higher ed, and only four of them are right by the sea, are doctoral granting, and are Hispanic serving. We've got to build our identity around that kind of uniqueness. We have to take advantage of it. Now, some of these institutions are tier one. That's doctoral granting, highest research activity. That's where ADEM, College Station, and UT are. Some are tier two, higher research activity. That's where Texas State and UTSA are. We are tier three, modern research activity. So, it doesn't really matter how you need, what kind of identity you have, if you don't increase your rank. So why do we want to increase our rank? Because rank equals reputation, which equals name recognition, which means more students are going to attend Texas A&M University Corpus Christi. This is an interesting study from George Georgetown University. It notes that underrepresented students and Caucasians do equally well in selective, let's call them ranked universities. In other words, even though underrepresented students are often not as prepared as higher income Caucasian students, when they go to a selective university, they do just as well. That does not happen in the universities that are more open. In fact, this is a really interesting point. If you take a student with a higher GRE, I mean SAG, and you send them to a open access university, they don't necessarily do better than the students with the lower SATs. So there's something about those ranked selective institutions that lead to greater student success. So what is it? First of all, universities that have a comprehensive range and excellent undergraduate and graduate programs. Let's take a look at this party ranking again. If you look at full-time retention rates for 2015, you go from Tier 3 to Tier 2 to Tier 1, the retention rate increases as you go up that classification. For some reason, the more highly classified you are as a doctoral granting institution, the better job you do with student retention. We're at about 60%. Six-year graduation rate, same story. Go from tier three to tier two to tier one, and you increase the percentage of students who graduate in six years as you go up that rank. So why is that? Yes, it helps to have very well-prepared students, very motivated students. I know, but it's not the only explanation, as I just showed you, from that Georgetown study. How many of you have had a debate or heard somebody debating the teaching versus learning thing? Raise your hand. Spend too much time in the lab, you're not teaching students. That's not going to help the students succeed. And then, so what does it mean? I say if you spend too much time teaching, you're not bringing in enough research funds and you can't cover the emerging research universe. That debate has been going on for quite a while all around the United States. I'd like you to consider something. We're changing the paradigm from focusing on the teacher to focusing on the student, the learner. So I'm going to ask you a question. If I teach 
in a forest by myself. Nobody sees me. Nobody hears me. Does anybody learn anything? Yes? No. If I conduct research in a forest by myself, nobody sees me, nobody hears me. Does anybody learn? I learn. And then I pass that on. The point here is very simple. You get more learning when you have a teaching and research. It's not one or the other. Okay. How many of you have heard the, the phrase, vision without funding is a hallucination? <laughs> okay. Research funding is the fuel of a research university. That's why people at RCO spend a lot of time trying to enable the faculty and researchers to bring in more funding. And that's what this university has been doing. With the hard work of the colleges, the institutes, the centers, the faculty, the staff, finance and administration, everybody around this university, we are increasing the amount of funding, extramural funding, that's coming into this university. Now, interestingly, most of that funding goes to salaries. So I'm going to ask you a question. Of this funding, do you think that the amount that goes to the faculty is greater than two-thirds, between two-thirds and one-third, or less than one-third? Who thinks greater than two-thirds? Very good. Who thinks one-third to two-thirds? Who thinks one-third or less? You guys really know your stuff. The majority of funding is spent on salaries. One in three workers that is supported by this funding is either a graduate student or an undergraduate student. One in three is either research staff or staff scientists. Fifty percent are things that we spend around the community. So there is a major local interest, I mean local impact of having research funding, textural funding at a university. That is something that the community looks at very, very carefully because it can help the community grow. In fact, economists will tell you there's very little money that the federal government spends greater ROI, return on investment, than research funding because knowledge is gained, Discoveries are made, jobs are created, there's training, new companies, local growth, benefit in. In fact, research at AM Corpus Christi was a bridge from potential to opportunity <coughs> for Daniel Mendes, a local student, worked in RCO. Graduated in mechanical engineering, interned at the Lone Star test site. He is now working there as a UAS engineer, and he's supporting a major client on one of our biggest grants. Research here was a bridge from potential to opportunity for Christian science. Christian is going to graduate in computer science this August. She worked with the rest of what I call the Big Bang Kids in Dr. Motti's micro lab. She had an offer from General Motors, and she has an offer from USAA, which she will take this fall in San Antonio. Research at a and Corpus Christi was a bridge from potential to opportunity for Shane Reed. Shane is a master's student in psychology. Shane was the winner of the three-minute thesis. Shane is going to go to the prestigious Rice University for a PhD. 
And finally, and this is my absolute favorite, research was a bridge from potential to opportunity from Josette Delgado. Josette is a master's student in marine biology. She works at the Isotope Coral Lab with Dr. Paula Rose. Josette was one of 90 people who applied for a position at the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in New Zealand. These are 90 people around the world. She was hired and she is gone. She comes from El Paso, Texas. Wow. So, this is the kind of story that is created when you have research along with the teaching. But it's not just about the money. It never is just about the money. Here's an interesting factor. Think about this. Look at these three different data points for expenditures. A and of Commerce, A and of Corpus Christi, and University of North Texas. How many in here would not agree that AM Corpus Christi has more restricted, excuse me, restricted research expenditures than the other two universities. Right? So why is North Texas tier one and why is commerce tier two? Anybody know? <coughs> we bring in more money than they do. Why? Doctoral programs. Doctoral programs are the apex of that pyramid. And unfortunately, we have not been keeping up with our competition in the state of Texas in terms of developing masters in doctoral programs. Although I am very pleased to say that we have a new DMP and two new masters programs since 2015. But the point is, this is one of our biggest challenges. PhD programs are difficult to get approval for, highly political, doesn't graduate a large number of people, it requires very specialized faculty, and they're expensive to run. But you can't get up that classification ladder if you don't grow your PhD programs. That is why, and I think if you asked me, you wouldn't have said that Congress is higher than we are. That is why Congress is up there, and that is why North Texas is up there. So one thing here, this widening of the bridge, I hope you get the sense that it's not just about widening the opportunity for students. It's also for staff. And if you have more successful students, and you have more successful staff, then you end up with more successful faculty. But in the final analysis, if you want to send yourself to a university, or your children, or your grandchildren, or you want to recommend that to a relative or a friend, the one thing you're going to ask yourself, what is going to be the value of the investment that I've made in that is should all be asking yourselves. And there's a recent interesting article coming out of the Brookings Institution where they ask the question, which universities add value most? It's a difficult thing to compare the AM Corpus Christi to Stanford with their multiple billions of endowments. But they came up with a way to address the particular student characteristics, the college you go to, and then ask the question, what kind of salary are the graduates earning in their mid-careers compared to other universities of similar time? And they did this study for the whole United States, and they've done this study for public institutions in Texas. How many of you in this room think that the greatest value added is at the University of Texas in Austin? 
How many of you think the greatest value added is at the University of Texas A&M University in College Station? How many of you think it is Texas A&M University Corpus Christi? How many of you, of you would have said it is A&M International at the radio? Okay. What is it that makes that happen? What creates added value for your children, grandchildren, relatives, and friends? The study noted a couple things. The universities that add value have a curriculum that aligns with the regional R&D needs, research and development needs, and workforce needs. <coughs> In other words, we have to understand what the hiring market is, and our curriculum has to align it. We, particularly the College of Education, has to work with the local school districts to make greater preparation of students for STEM participation. Because seven out of 10 of the highest earning Bachelor of Science degrees are in engineering. Just a fact. We have to up our completion rates. And the way we do that is with all of these high impact practices, service learning, research experiences, internships, we have to work internally and with the community to make that happen. But the most important thing is that we have to keep hiring and retaining the best faculty and staff. And the way to do that is to partner internally and externally to create this island as a destination location, a place that people want to come work at, and a place that people want to have their whole career. And if we do that, with a sprinkle of research here and there, we will get greater and greater student success. Because in the end, we are an island university that has a bridge to Corpus Christi, the region, Texas, the nation, and the world. Thank you for what you do. I'd be glad to answer any questions. The question, of, the question is, what are we doing to increase doctoral programs? I think that has two sides to it. One of them, the political side, and another one, uh, a side that involves the faculty coming together and agreeing on what makes sense for the university. Politically, there really aren't enough doctoral programs in South Texas. We've been having that conversation now for decades. And I think it's important to reinitiate that conversation because when people go to universities like ours, the average distance that a student, and that also includes graduate, not just undergraduate, the average distance a student travels is 50 miles or less. So if you do the geography, it's pretty obvious that if all of the doctoral programs are in the northern part of the state of Texas, you're not going to get enough participation in doctoral programs from people that are growing up in South Texas. That has to be discussed. It has to be made clear that it is not a done deal that we will accept that we're not going to continue to be able to build doctoral programs. Then again, we have to be smart. We are not going to get a doctoral program in English literature here because it's just not going to happen. So we have to do, for example, with the geospatial computing science, pick on our strengths and create something that makes sense about who we are and who is around us that might be hired. And I think that's a strategy. 
Yes. So with that being said, what is Tim UCC doing to connect with the community to bring in those STEM students? Connect with the community to? To bring in those STEM students, to keep them from going to other universities. I think the answer to that is not enough. I don't think we are as connected, uh, and, and this is not my area of expertise. I don't think, but I get the feeling we're not as connected with the independent school districts. We are not as connected with Del Mar. And listen carefully to what I say. We are not working as well in aligning with and having discussions with Kingsville to ensure that more students end up going into STEM. Because I would argue that if we work together with, with Del Mar, Kingsville, and a and Cor Corpus Christi and bring in everybody, that's going to end up creating a bigger pie of STEM students, and we will all share that. Uh, in your vision, how, what is the average time a process like this should take? 20 years, 10 years? I'm going to borrow from a wonderful article that the president of the University of North Texas wrote. This is a long process. If this ultimately has to be what I envision, I won't be here. This is going to be the legacy that those of you who have just joined the university are going to be able to take forward. So it, it's a long road, and it, and it doesn't happen overnight. And I think perhaps some of you would agree with me. I think that one of the issues that we've had at this university getting behind this notion is that nobody ever made it clear that it was a long process. So there are all these people that are getting really nervous because, oh my god, I've got to bring in a million dollars. It's got to happen by tomorrow, and we're not going to make it. It, it isn't that quick. It isn't that simple. It is a very long, slow process. But it has to be one that everybody gets behind and understands what their role is in making that happen. Well, again, thank you very much. Have a wonderful afternoon.